In Australia, we're drowning in a sea of household debt. We own more per person than just about anywhere else on the planet. If that means you're pouring your hard-earned into a mortgage, then count yourself lucky. Because if you're among the one in eight Aussies living in poverty, chances are it's not a regular bank that's got its hooks into you. So people are going out getting continuous loans, and you know, loan after loan after loan, and then getting Going themselves in debt. debt, and then try to consolidate that debt, it just, once again, gets them into more debt. The people that offer loans and stuff, they do prey on the people that are vulnerable because it's the people that are vulnerable that need the loans, but they're all just thinking about extra cash. Okay, we'll give you 200 bucks, but we want 500 back from you. How is that gonna help anybody? Depending on how much you get out, you got to pay back double or sometimes even triple that depending on how long you take the, uh, the loan out for. So, struggle street all over again. For unemployed Melbourne dad, Alan, keeping one eye on his creditors and one on the kids is no easy task. You guys OK? Originally from the Cook Islands, Alan's been out of work for the best part of three years. And now he's found himself trapped in a cycle of debt, just trying to provide for his young family. What the fuck? What the? They live on the Banksia Gardens estate, a public housing project built in broad meadows in the 70s. It's seen its fair share of trouble over the years, but it's the kind of place where everyone keeps an eye out for each other. Um, no, I saw, I did see him like about an hour ago, though. Oh, shit. Maybe at Banksy Gardens? Oh, you better not be. I'll have a look then. I'll go around here. Thank you. OK, no worries. That guy always, like, he's a really good kid, but he just takes off whenever he feels like. He never used to, cos maybe he used to stay here and stay in the court. Mm. Despite his money worries, Alan's been able to get a $5,000 loan to start a gardening business through a federal government incentive scheme. And he's recently made his most important purchase. It's a Toyota Hilux, it's a uh, 99, uh, 94 model, and um, it's a dual cap and high enough to, uh, you know, to pull the uh, trailer, and also I can fit a toolbox in the back. So I'm pretty wrapped at the moment. Alan's gardening business is his way out of the mountain of debt he's acquired over the last few years. That debt includes over $4,000 in fines. Like a magistrate court fines, you know, for driving an unregistered vehicle with a suspended licence. You know, I've got caught speeding through the cameras and I'm uh, not wearing a seatbelt, you know, and this and that. It's just, I was just right under the pressure. So, you know, all, all those things just adds up, you know, and then I was sort of like trying to get on a payment plan. I just couldn't, you know, keep up with it because I had other bills and debts as well to pay. Those other debts, over 30 grand's worth, are from a series of so-called payday loans. High interest rates, no credit checks. You might call them lenders of last resort. That was the whole reason why we, you know, we actually went downhill because of the payday loans. That's what got me into so much debt and because I couldn't keep up with the payments and then the interest went up, kept going up, it started piling up and then to the point I couldn't, I let it go and then it just started just building up building you know, to the point it was like four, five times, seven times I have to pay back, seven, yeah. Well, hopefully this business will get it going. Once we get it going, that, that's it, mate. I ain't going to be struggling. I'll be driving a Lamborghini soon. Driving a Lamborghini and some sort of, I don't know, Ferrari or something like that. Hmm. Do you honestly believe that? Mate, anything's possible. But Alan's optimism is masking a darker truth. And I had a phone call from the sheriff, um, you know, about my financial situation, saying they're going to try and, um, you know, take possession of all my belongings, my car, you know, clamp my, my, my vehicle, suspend my licence again, take me to court. But I said, go ahead. Because at the moment, I can only afford this, this and that. Um, you know, I've got so much bills to pay. The sheriff's officers are the no-nonsense debt collectors of the State Justice Department. They hunt down court-ordered fines and enforce payment. When they say they'll come and repossess your car, they will do it. They'll actually literally come and call you up and say, that's it, your license, license been suspended. So at the moment, I'm um, so sc screwed, it's not even funny, that I feel like just sometimes just running away from Australia. Yeah. Closer to town, and there are plenty of others doing it tough too. Whether it's paying back a dodgy loan, 
or trying to make welfare payments go the distance, it can sometimes feel like an unwinnable battle. We have $34 left for a week. They've got all their stuff, but I've got $34 left. I run out of money the next day or the day after from a payday. My money lasts me two or three days. All right. That sucks, doesn't it? All right, boys. Come on, come in. Michael's on a disability pension for mental health issues and lives in Melbourne's inner west. Since his mother's funeral three weeks ago, he's been trying to get his life in order. Um, all right, so I've picked up all my rubbish in here. Right, I've got to clean up a bit more, but you can see it's improving. And um, all the rubbish that was here, I've bagged up. So I'm making progress. I live in transitional housing and it's housing that I, I have until they find me um, a permanent house somewhere. <laughs> a few garbage bags of rubbish. <laughs> I've put them in here so the dogs can't rip them up and I can get rid of three, maybe go down the street and see whose bin's not full and, you know. I feel safe here and that's a really big thing. Sometimes with commission um, houses, you don't know if you're gonna be next to a fucking a feral fucking um, wife beater or, you know, just, just some horror stories that I've seen in my life. Michael didn't always live this way. What are you doing, you scallywag? Come here. He grew up in a middle-class family and attended some of Victoria's top private schools. Come here to me. <laughs> You've been a cheeky boy. It was a sort of family, if you ask for a red BMX for Christmas, you got one. So that, to me, is being spoiled. I was so straight and I was so fucking innocent. Blonde haired, blue eyed, fucking Richie Cunningham. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink. You know. But at school, he suffered bullying so severe it sent him on a downward spiral that led to petty crime. And at the age of 19, Michael tried heroin for the first time. Like anyone that uses for the first time, I didn't think I would get hooked. I didn't think that. Uh, it would happen to me, and it did, and it happened real quick. And, uh, yeah. What have you got there? Ooh, you got a mouth guard. But I've had lots of different lives. I've had a comfortable life with mum and dad. I've had a life on the streets. I've had a life as a dope fiend for 10 years, you know? I've been in prison, and that was fun. <laughs> I had the time of my life. I did. I, the best people at the time of my life. I, I can't go on about it enough. The food, everything. Trying to get back on the straight and narrow, Michael hasn't touched heroin for nearly 20 years. But he's been on methadone ever since. Why have I stayed on it? It's almost impossible to get off. People said at the time, when I, I went to go on it, they go, don't go on methadone, you'll never get off it. All these people that were on it at the chemist, go, don't go on it. And uh, I just thought anything was better than how I was, right? I couldn't spend another day chasing the dragon, you know? Oi. Yeah, so it's 35 bucks a week. You've got to go to the chemist every day and have a dose in front of the chemist. You get takeaways and they put it in a little bottle. Um, this is a takeaway bottle that I've made my bong out of. <laughs> He's the best dog in town. He's great. He's gorgeous. Thanks, mate. Yeah, he is, mate. I've got no family anymore except my brother, who obviously hates my guts. So he's in Colac in Mum's house. He's done nothing about finding somewhere else. Michael's mum passed away a month ago, but he's yet to see a copy of her will. Her estate includes a house in Colac, a two-hour train ride from Melbourne. But he and his brother have fallen out big time. And just the other week, it even came to blows. He's applied for um, a restraining order and I had to go to fucking Colac and uh... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Cheeky bugger, come on. I love him, I love the bloke, but um, oh, he's got a very fractured personality. He's got some serious issues, that boy. He's, uh, he's a walking fucking disaster. Like it or not, Michael's going to need to smooth things over with his brother before his mum's estate can be sorted. All righty, let's go home.
Back in Banksia Gardens, single mum Tamara is facing financial challenges of her own. I have to stick to a pretty strict budget. Um, I can't always afford all the books for schools. I can't always afford to get her uniforms. Are you allowed to wear that jumper? That's why I had it underneath my jacket. And then it's just keeping up with everything else that I guess your kids need. So the lower your income, the less you can provide for your children. And then you've got to, you know, yeah, it's hard. One more. Have a good day. Yeah, go to work and then I'm um, going to spend some time. I've got a, an appointment with a new lady, um, sign up a new client. Tamara has a part-time cleaning job, which she's hoping might one day become a fully-fledged business. But in a cruel twist of fate, if her business succeeds, she could be saddled with a $60,000 government debt. Maybe I shouldn't grow my business because as soon as my business hits a certain threshold, then I'm actually going to have to pay back a debt. That's because she's a victim of the failed Vet Fee Help Scheme, a government-funded program that saw thousands of vulnerable Aussies like Tamara tricked into signing up for overpriced online diplomas, often with the lure of a free laptop. The catch? Tamara would need to repay 60 grand in fees once her income hit 54,000 a year. I don't even know what else I need to take with me. Today, she's heading into the city to find out her legal rights. And I'm still trying to process how it's all placed together, what part the government had in this and what they thought was right and wrong. And so there's still so much about all this that I'm still trying to place to work out, wow, like this is, this is so big. The Consumer Action Law Centre has been swamped with inquiries just like Tamara's. Tamara, this is Denise. Do you want to tell a bit about a bit of your story? Part of it's embarrassing, I guess, for me because of where I was. So I've, I've just, um, I'd just come out of homelessness um, and I was a drug addict at the time. Somebody knocked on my door one day yeah. and offered me these amazing courses that you could do in order to do these courses. We give you the laptop because it's an online course, so you actually need mm. the laptop in order to do the course. Did you um, have internet at the time? No, I don't think I did, to be honest. Two online courses yeah. without internet? Yeah. 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 It blows the mind, doesn't it? He then explained to me that I didn't even need to complete the courses. Once I had the laptop, the laptop was mine. Honestly, I should have known better. I did it anyway. They're, they're actually trained to complete the sale. Yeah. And so they'll use various techniques to get you to make the commitment. And you can be stone cold sober and have it happen mm. to you. So ultimately you're left with owing money to the government for a course that you never started, yeah. was unsuitable for you um, and was missold to you. So even though the Phoenix Institute, the private college she signed up with, has since gone bust and been taken to court by the government, she may still be lumbered with a lifelong debt. And one of the things they're seeking is the court to order that anyone who's entered into a contract and got a vet fee help debt with Phoenix Institute since the start of 2015, that contract, if they win, would be voided, mm -hmm. and so would the fee help debt. I suppose there's a glimmer of hope yeah. that you get some justice, really. <sighs> That's yeah. all we're here for. So thank you so much for your time today. Anytime. I really do appreciate you going through everything with me and just easing some of that. Yeah, we'll be in yeah. touch. Awesome, fantastic. Right. Thank you guys. See ya. See ya. I feel like that was a really positive outcome, and it might take a while before the, we see anything, but. You know, this, this is in good hands. And they have a real compassion for the people, which I think is really important. And they see that an injustice has been done. So I don't think they're gonna stop until they get the right outcome, which is positive, it's great. So I feel good. Michael's also hoping a visit to the lawyers might pay dividends. He's come to Colac, 150 k's from Melbourne, where his mother lived her final years to see what she left him in her will. Doesn't look like there's anyone there. I'll just go and make sure. There is someone there. All right. Good morning. Despite being the black sheep of the family, 
He's hoping his mother has looked after him in the end. So I've got my paperwork. Um, she's a nice lady. Michael and his younger brother Stephen were her only immediate family. I might just um, look at this will because I haven't seen it yet. I'm pretty sure I know what's in it. Mum said she was going to leave everything to her two children. It's pretty straightforward, but uh, seats are a bit wet there. I might just have a look here. It says here that my cousin is to get Mum's jewellery. Um, I thought my cousin might like some more stuff than that. Like, for instance, she's, Mum was always going on about her Natutsi couch. Don't sit on my Natutsi couch, she used to say, because um, we'd mark it. It was like a $5,000 couch or something. Um, it doesn't say anything about the car. But it's, what's left for you? Um, the house. It says the real estate is for me and my brother um, and everything else. But um, I sort of feel like a big grotty. I'm not glad that Mum's dead. I didn't get along well with Mum, but um, I'd much rather my parents be alive. But um, it seems like it's a natural part of life, though, for a lot of people. When their parents die, they leave them what they had. And half of me says, well, that's fair enough. The other half, I feel like I'm being a bit money hungry reading this. Michael's cousin has stood down as executor of the estate, leaving the two brothers with the job. So this is the problem. My brother's an executor as well. So there's two executors. Um, and we don't get along. So that's just a recipe for a lot of problems. In fact, relations are at an all-time low. After a recent altercation, Stevens applied to the Colac Magistrates Court for a family violence intervention order against Michael. I can't get any photos of Mum. My brother won't return any phone calls. And he's applied for an intervention order now, so I suspect just so I don't annoy him. You know? You know what I wish about my brother? I wish he'd just keep his dignity and let me keep mine. This is all very undignified. I mean, it's pretty simple. Split the bloody real estate up, sell it, go your own way. Kick on with life, you know? This is just really horrible stuff. And um, there's only one word for it. And it begins with C, you know? He's a real... I just wish he wasn't seven foot and I could lay him out, you know? He's a big boy. Big. Solid. If the magistrate grants Stephen his intervention order, Michael would be prohibited from approaching or even contacting his brother. I've got a summons. He's got an application he wants to make. He's got to turn up. If he doesn't turn up, it gets thrown out. I'll go home. Freezing me balls off in Colac. Here comes my brother. Yeah. In Colac, southwest of Melbourne, Michael's about to come face to face with his brother Stephen. Here comes my brother. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Their mother has left her Colac house to both brothers. Can we talk? Can we talk? Michael's hoping he might also get her old car, although there's no mention of it in the will. Yeah, eh? I'm all right. Stephen is currently living in the house. You're right. But after a recent dust up, right. he's applied for an intervention order to prevent right. Michael coming near him. And that could mean problems getting their mum's will sorted. Look, yeah, don't, don't fucking worry about this shit. All, all it is, it's just to make me feel safer, so. Well, can we fuck it off? No, I've, I've got to go through with it now. It doesn't mean shit. It only becomes a problem if you... Yeah, but I, I can't... come out of yourself. I can't have that, Stephen, while all this will stuff's going on. And I'm not threatening you with anything. I'm saying I'll, I'll just have to contest it. But I'm not coming up to Colac annoying you at the moment. No, I, I know. But, well, you've got to look at it from my point of view. Last time I saw you... You followed me around fucking Footscray attacking me? Yeah, that was random, and I didn't get a punch in or anything. You flew me to the ground, which was fair enough, yeah. you know? Look, can we just... just... No, I can't fuck it off. I've got to go through it. You can withdraw an application. No, I'm, I'm going through with it. All right. You can fucking contest it. All right. Take fuck for that. Can I pick up um, some photos today? What do you mean, pick them up? 
Pick up photos. I want to get some you photos. You want to take shit from Mum's house. That's what you're saying. They're my photos too. Yeah, a copy of photos. Yeah. I wouldn't stop you having photos of Mum and Dad, but... But that's what I don't get. You're always banging on. Oh, I want to get the photos. I want to get the photos. But if you take the photos from the house, then... Where are they? They're sitting in fucking Seddon. The brothers are co-executors of their mother's will, but right now, they can't agree on anything. Well, I can make copies if there's a stick. There is no stick. I think Mum was talking fucking shit there. Well, well yeah, even that disc that, that, that you made for the funeral, I could copy that disc easy, but um, I can what do disc? it at the discs that they played at the funeral. It's a CD? Yeah, yeah. Three songs on it? Well, I had a lot of pictures. Oh, there's a, yeah, there is a disc with pictures on it too. Yeah. yeah um, I just haven't had pictures and, you know, um, I think it, it's best that I, I don't take anything from the house until all well, the lawyers speak. That's and that, well, I'm fine with that. Oh, and by the way, the rego's about to run out of the fucking car. I can't pick that up today, can I? Well, It'd help a lot. Yeah, it would help a lot. But as I just said, the rego is about to run out. So you'll be driving an unregistered car. How long do you think you'll fucking last in that? He keeps going on about he wants to come and get the photos. And I'm like, well, why do you want to remove the photos from Mum's house? Because they're my photos too. I don't have any photos of my parents. So there's that. Then there's the car. He wants the car, and which he'll, he'll treat like shit, like he does with every other car he's ever had. And he'll drive it into the ground. He's living at Mum's, rent free. He's got he, he's got her phone, and he doesn't want me to go to. Hi, Michael speaking. Hello. Hi. Hi. Good. What's up? A call from Michael's social worker. Yeah. Turns his day from bad to worse. Helen will go back to the cat and seek a possession order to kick you out of the place. Okay. I'll try and get the money today. All right. Um, Mum's dead. I'm at court at, in Colac, for Christ's sake. It's three hours from Melbourne. Um, my brother's been a real bastard. And I... I, I understand, Michael, but... Yeah. But, I mean, ultimately, if it's important to you to keep the place... It is important. Um, if, if you do have the money, you should try and pay today. I can't. I, I can't. I don't have the money. And I'm, I had... Oh. Sorry, did that hang up? No, I, I can't. I, I don't have the money and I couldn't get to Colac. And if I didn't get to Colac, he's going to have an intervention order and then I can't execute Mum's will. Hello? Yeah, they're going to evict me. Because I missed rent on Wednesday. So that's it. I have to get out of there within two weeks. In Brisbane's southwest, home for the past two weeks for Jared, Sharon and their four kids has been this prefab shed. Why, son, you gotta stop wearing my t-shirts, man. Why? Because I fucking never got in. The family's been without a proper home since Jared was released from jail. And since then, they've been struggling on all fronts. As Kiwis, they're only entitled to a $400 a week family tax benefit. And both parents are battling a recent addiction to ice. I don't want to be doing it anymore. I hate it. But I've said that so many times, but we've gone back to it. Their makeshift home is at the Koha Sheds Crisis Accommodation Facility near Anala. It's costing them $300 a week for rent and evening meals. So both Jared and Sharon are desperate to find work. Sharon wants to one day work in childcare. And with the Koha's help, she's making those first tentative steps. We're having an orientation with the girls today. They're studying um, the diploma of early childhood so that they are able to run and facilitate their own family daycares in their homes when they um, finally get accommodation in that, yeah. These are all the toys. For Sharon, because you know, for her, she's done nothing else but domestic cleaning. 
So she's really excited because that also gives her an opportunity to branch out into something different. Also, you know, a career behind her. We just sort of do the toys, like from infant up to four years old, I think it is. So, you know, different age groups and toys. You know, nothing too sharp or anything that babies can choke on and cut themselves off. It's an income for me and the kids. You know, something we don't have at the moment. It's good for me to do something different, yeah. It's pretty big for her, it's pretty big. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm fucking so proud of her. It's a big step for her. She's found something that she she's interested in. She's, she's a brilliant mum and she's brilliant with kids, so this, this career choice will suit her down to the ground, which will keep her happy, which keeps the family happy. The harsh reality, though, is that while Sharon continues to battle her drug demons, her chances of earning a decent income and escaping homelessness are getting smaller by the day. But no matter how bad things get, it's the little things that keep her going. Just remember, as your mum, to your, you four kids. I love you all so much. You're my four kids are my world. That has kept me going through the good times and bad times. My kids, you are the reason for living and making me smile so ever. So ever grateful. So ever grateful you all are my children. That have brought me so much joy to my life. And <clears throat> Love, Mum. Kiss, kiss. Alan's dreams for the future are not just about money. They're more about the things that really matter. And I'm doing this for my kids, for my wife. Well, I hope my kids won't struggle the way I am struggling at the moment. He's just days away from launching his gardening business. Oh, hello, Benjamin. <laughs> Shit. But at any moment, the sheriff's office could seize his ute and trailer to recoup the thousands of dollars he owes in unpaid traffic fines. Alex, can you? Alex. The business is Alan's big chance to work his way out of debt. Alex, stop. 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 I've never been an angry person, but there's times when I get value stressed out or, you know, have like a lot of anxieties. It just triggers me to go all mentally frustrated and angry. And that's when I have like bad episodes of all these like sort of like convulsions or fits, you know, like anger, fits of anger and everything. And I just get so confused and frustrated to the point that I could, can't um, concentrate. Seven years ago, Alan was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He also suffers from anxiety and OCD and takes medication to keep him on an even keel. It's a daily routine I have to take, you know, so I, so I will be stabilised for the rest of the day. So I feel, you know, I won't feel all moody and all upset. So that's why I've got to keep up with my meds. That's the most important thing as well. Today, Alan's heading to the Broadmeadows Legal Centre to get some much needed assistance dealing with his overdue traffic infringements. Hopefully I can, you know, I'll get something good today at this meeting and uh, hopefully everything will be, you know, all my problems will be all fixed. Hopefully. Fingers crossed everything goes good. Alan? Come through, thanks. Hello, there you go. My name's Craig, I'm going to be the solicitor helping you out no tonight. No worries, thank you. Come on through. You just take a seat on the other side of the desk. For someone in Alan's financial situation, access to free legal aid is a godsend. And so we've got $4,011.90 worth of infringements. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of the things that we can look at are whether or not you have any special circumstances surrounding the infringement. So mm. whether you suffered from a mental illness at the time mm -hmm. the offences were committed, 
whether or not you're homeless, mm -hmm. whether or not you had a drug and alcohol addiction, mm -hmm. okay? If, th if any of those apply mm -hmm. and you um, can link the commission of the offence back to that stage in your life, mm -hmm. you can make an application to the infringements court to have them waived. His offences date back to 2009, when he was first diagnosed with schizophrenia. Before that, I didn't know what it was. I don't know what kind of sickness it was. Even my parents didn't know what it was. You know, they didn't know this kind of sickness where we come from. Our background, we didn't, we didn't know schizophrenia or like, like just all these kind of sickness. Okay. Well, we used to think that people just gone crazy. You gone crazy. You just gone crazy. That's it. Yeah. It, I am bothered by the fact that the sheriff is banging down your door, though. Mm -hmm. um, so, in terms of things that we can do today, I can get you to fill in the form. We send that off with a covering letter saying that because of the schizophrenia you couldn't control your behaviour and mm. that's how the infringements occurred. Yeah. We have the medical evidence to support that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm confident of a positive result. Mm -hmm. And then if the sheriff comes around you can give them my business card and tell them to yeah. call yeah. Craig at the legal centre because oh, there's an application for special circumstances that's yeah. already occurred. At least for now, Alan's got a reprieve from the constant threat of having his ute and trailer repossessed. At any stage, you have any questions or queries, you have my card. I've give got me your a card. Call. Any problem, I'll give you. I'll give yeah. you a call. Fantastic. Yep. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for Thank coming in today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, service today. I really appreciate no it. No worries. Thank you very much. We'll see how we go. Yep. Eh? Thank you. But sometimes it seems it can be one step forward and two steps back. A simple visit to the chemist, and suddenly there's another problem. I don't know what reason it is. They, they've taken, uh, they've, I don't know. Taken one up off the they've thing. Taken you off, yeah. Okay. okay. This keeps getting better. Every time something, one problem gets fixed, the next one comes up. What happened? My freaking Centrelink got cut off. Then I've got to pay for the damn full price for the medications. So I've got to give these pricks a call. Sorry about the government, <laughs> but I'm going to give them a call and see what's going on. From one problem fixed, the next one pops up. Never stops. Does it? <sighs> At the moment, I'm really, really pissed off. If you believe what you hear on the news, we're doing pretty well on the unemployment front compared to the rest of the world. But the numbers don't always tell the full story. Where you live can have a major effect on your chance of a job. There's not a lot of employment opportunities. I've known people that have been in this area for about 10 years that's still looking for work. Once you say you, your address, sometimes you can't find a job. Once you live here, there's something wrong with you. In Melbourne's Broad Meadows, the official jobless rate is more than four times the national average, a whopping 25%. And that's not counting others only working part-time and struggling to get enough hours to keep their heads above water. Alan's been out of full-time work for over three years now, and he's as keen as anyone to get back into the workforce. I don't know what reason it is. They've, they've taken... Uh, they've, I don't know. Take your mind off the they've thing. Taken you off, yeah. OK. But with just two days before his new gardening business is due to kick off, he's got another problem to deal with. Essentially, it's cut off my, um, my healthcare card, so I have to pay full price. Instead of paying $5.26, I have to pay 30 bucks. So at the moment, I'm really, really pissed off. Because he's now receiving money from the government's new enterprise incentive scheme, his Centrelink payments have stopped. Unfortunately, so too has his government healthcare card, and that means he no longer qualifies for cheaper medications. I'm just going to walk over to Centrelink there, it's just right there. Might as well just get it out of the way. Uh, not a good day today. We'll be going. Mate, the line looks about there's about 400 people in line. So I'm pretty much screwed. I'm not going to wait for the next two, three hours. I'll just call them on the phone. It never rains, but it pours. Alan's also due in court today and can't wait for hours at Centrelink to sort the healthcare card issue in person. Mate, busy, busy, never ends. Just keeps going. His mental health issues mean most of his overdue government fines could be waived but there's no getting out of an overdue court fine. Unless he pays it, 
he's likely to incur more fines or have his work ute repossessed. Um, look, I've got a fine of the $714 from the magistrate courts and my instalments will be $50 a, a month and that's the cheapest they will give to me and I'm happy with that. Now that's sorted, he still needs to get onto Centrelink and that cancelled healthcare card. I just got back from Broadmeadow, so I'm Centrelink. I'm telling you, the line, it's crazy. It's just where you walk into the entrance, that's where the line starts, from outside the door. And I'm not going to wait around because I've got things to do tonight. I've got the kids to pick up, I've got my medication sorted, I've got my business to get on top of it. If I'm starting with this knees program, I'm just over the top of my head and it's really, really stressing me out, you know? I just got back from the courts and sorted out all these other fines, you know? I'm in so much debt, so much shit I've got to sort out. It's not even funny, man. Oh, if you can, bro, man, if I see, ever see you one day, if I win one million or a big jackpot, I'll give you, I'll give you some of it. <laughs> Centrelink agrees to send out the forms Alan needs to reapply for his healthcare card. Oh, Bill. Mate, never stops. Happy, 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 yuck, uh, yuck, and oh, I'm going to prison. Yay! <laughs> After a day of setbacks and jumping through bureaucratic hoops, it looks like Alan's gardening company is one step closer to reality. <laughs> Finally got it. I can do it, Ali man. I can do it. So I wanted to put like my logo on my like on invoice papers, on pens. So hopefully that in, in, in the future, if I pick up and I make a lot of money, I can actually hire more like staff or you know employees. You know that can get them to wear my uniform, my logo, and it would just make me proud. You know I'll be happy. You know. All going well. Alan's about to earn a crust for the first time in over three years. But for Michael, the road to financial security has some ways to go. Oh. He's travelled to country Victoria to do battle with his brother Stephen. But right now, he's facing a more immediate crisis back home in Melbourne. G'day Danny. Yeah, it's, it's Mick, how are you? Um, no, you're all right. Listen, I've got a, a major problem and I want you to listen to me, all right? Yep. It's not an emergency, but it's an emergency for me. They're going to evict me unless I pay them 110 today, and I can't because I don't get paid till Wednesday. And, and I, I think it's asking too much to lend it off anybody, but can I lend it until Wednesday, please? It's, I'm really desperate, like, like um, I'm going to get evicted if I don't put it in today. <laughs> It's not the first time he's missed paying his rent and been threatened with eviction. His mate Danny is his last hope. So you'll lend me it. Oh, thank fuck, Danny. I'll, I'll fix you up Wednesday. Yep. Nah, 100%. All right, I'm just going to ring the landlord now and I'll ring you back to Savo. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right. Crisis All right. averted. But Michael's day in the country is becoming even more difficult than he imagined. Oh, difficult if you say, if you call, you know, your brother living in your dead mum's house, you know, and won't even give you a photo of her. That's difficult. That's very difficult. You know, the rest of it's just normal financial juggling. Some bastard's always after you for money when you're poor. He's hoping his inheritance might one day change all that. But before the will can be dealt with, there's the small matter of his brother's application for a family violence intervention order. You just did it to piss me off, didn't you? Because you thought, oh, <laughs> you thought, ha, 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 he has to come to Colac. You thought he has to come down to Colac. Ha, ha, ha. I know you, Stephen. <laughs> Before the application goes in front of the magistrate, Michael tries a compromise. All right, I'll sign the, um, the undertaking and it'll go before a magistrate in a minute. He agrees to make a legal undertaking not to harass Stephen, and in return, Stephen will drop his application. Christ, oh, just, what a pain in the ass spending all morning in bloody Colac, you know? Just to say, yeah, we'll make an undertaking. What a fucking idiot. You know? There's a word for it, it's blonk. He's a blonk. Do you know what a blonk is? Go hit him in the head, that's the sound it makes, blonk. He's a blonk. <laughs> After three hours, they finally have a court-ordered resolution. Oh, it was a waste of the morning, wasn't it? Oh, Christ. Um, my brother's conceded 
or agreed to me making this undertaking that I won't um, commit acts of violence against him. <laughs> yeah, so I've said, yeah, all right, I won't commit acts of violence against the seven foot giant. Um, no worries. You know, so, so um, but if I do commit acts of violence against the said giant, then we're back here again. In the new spirit of conciliation, they agree that Stephen can stay in their mum's house until it's sold, and in return, Michael will get her car. You know, look, we don't get along, but I love you and my brother, and you're my only brother, and we've got to look after each other because there's no mum and dad anymore. It, it's it, and I'm not just saying it. So I'm going back on the train now, go back to Melbourne and organise this rent disaster. In Melbourne's Banksia Gardens, after all the months of preparation, Alan's business is off and running. Finally, his first job and a chance to start paying off that mountain of debt. Well, today I've got a uh, house up in Preston. It takes me half an hour to get there and half an hour to get back home. So um, I'm doing the, the lawn for, for 60 bucks. So out of that 60 bucks, it's gonna cost me petrol to go there and come back and also petrol for the lawnmower and the um, whipper slimper and two strong oil. So out of that, I'll probably profit around 20 to 30 bucks in my pocket. Not bad, it's better than nothing at all. Morning, Cheryl. How are you? Not too bad. How are you, love? How big is your backyard? Can I have a look at the backyard? Big. Big? Oh, I want to have a look. <clears throat> nice. It's a big one. Yes, it is. Yes, indeed. Well, I better get stuck into it then. If the business is successful, it will solve all my uh, stress and all my anxieties and all the bills that I've got. Yeah, but it'll just take time. It'll take time. It's not going to happen tomorrow or the day after. It'll take time. Oh, yes, please. Thank you very much. I thought it was Jim Beam. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. Cheryl. Now. Yeah, it's all done now. Thank you. Did you have a look at it? Yeah, nice. Yeah, I looked out the window. Oh, okay, beautiful. And how much do I owe you? 60 bucks. We'll see you again, okay? okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Look after yourself. Have a good day. Bye bye. A quick tidy up, and Alan's business has finally turned a profit. Hello? Yo. What do you mean? Oh. It's a family crisis. Oh, shit. His sister Nora's two dogs, Captain and Tasha, are missing. Hey. Nora. Hello? Fuck, my sister's pissed off. Apparently they went missing this morning because my brother and I had to carry the refrigerator that was on top of my trailer. Anyway, we took it inside the house and then I think my brother or myself must have left the, the gates open and both dogs went missing. Hello? The dogs have just been found but are being held by the council. How much? $2,000. What? Oh, uh, what, what a rip-off. $2,000 to get fucking two dogs out. Are you for fucking real? Fucking these people want money, man. Bastards. They've got nothing else to do but to fucking make money. Might as well be a fucking drug dealer and fucking start selling shit. Fucking dodgy shit, man. For Jared and Sharon and their four kids, the spectre of drugs hangs over their heads. Cooped up in a prefab shed, the pair is struggling to stay clean from ice. But with no clear way out of their predicament, their relationship has hit rock bottom. Same shit. 
Same bullshit. Same two-faced bitch, same fucking, same lies, same shit. It's just getting worse. It's getting real bad. It's all come back to like me cheating on Jared when Jared was away in prison. It's just escalated again. I'm tired of fighting and being asked to leave and not having much sleep at night because of the argument. With her mum and dad's relationship in freefall, 16-year-old Trinity is doing her best to cope as she approaches her year 11 exams. It's stressful having to go home and deal with all their stuff and where we are and everything. <coughs> I was so tired, I like broke down a few times today and started crying because I was so stressed out about it. And just, year 11 is so hard. Like it's hard for me because I chose the hard classes. I wanted to challenge myself and do something that'll benefit my future. I know Trini more better than anyone. You know, at, at 16, she is an amazing woman. But, but she's hurting. She's hurting bad. And um, I don't know if it's... I don't know if it's my fault. I don't know if it's her mum's fault. Um, she's not gonna say anything about it or, or pass the blame. She'll take it all on as herself. She's, she's been through hell. No, there's been a lot of damage over the last few years with them. Um, I sat you know. The domestics or arguments are becoming more regular. Change of mood swings with Sharon. We do suspect maybe there is some usage going on between them. We have a no drug policy. Yeah, so it would be, you know, instant dismissal. Have you guys been arguing again? Yes, I have. We would rather work with them, especially for the kids' sake, so that they don't end up on the streets. But with her life in tatters, Sharon's in no mood for working with anyone right now. I'm going to take a break because I can't do it anymore. I'm at breaking point. And it's not fair. I mean, I don't want to leave, but I have to leave because it's just going to get worse. Fucking two grand, are you for real? Seriously, that's for two dogs. No way, man, this is bullshit. Fucking pricks. Shit. Alan is in the doghouse with his sister Nora, but he's not alone. His brother's also there for his part in losing the dogs. They're not just dogs, they're family. Like people. But it's your fault. But it's uh, my, his fault. It's your fault. No, because he didn't explain to me how, how to shut the gate this morning. I was going to blame someone. I have to blame someone. Here we go. And that's because someone has to pay $2,000 in council fines to retrieve the dogs. Because Alan's saying that, but, that he locked it, he made sure that they locked it. When I say lock it, I didn't actually lock it with the padlock, you know, with the actual thing that goes around and lock it with the key. I actually locked it. The hinges went onto the top of the lock, so when it clicks in, that's it, it locks. But I didn't know the dog can actually hit it and go, and it'll open the gate. That's what I was saying. <laughs> oh, it's a pretty smart dog. So it is your photo? Pretty much. It is. He's like... got to go and look for more clients, work his ass off and pay my dog. <laughs> <laughs> pay for it. Or he's got to come and pick this shit up for free. <laughs> I'll work for her for two months for free. <laughs> Alan's business is off to a disappointing start. After just one day, his gardening service is already deeply in the red. I do everything. If I have to sell my trailer, I'll sell my trailer to get him back. Oh, I'll sell him. I'll trade him in to get my dog back. <laughs> I'll go in the I'll get a little behind. <laughs> they can put him in the lost dog homes. <laughs> they'll put him down after 48 hours. <laughs> after they feed him the first time, they'll be like, nah, this dog eats too much. <laughs> we'll kill him. <laughs> we'll put him down. <laughs> So if you just put like a, that blue cloth, just lay that underneath the tray that you're going to put down. Yep, perfect. Alan's neighbour Tamara has also had the threat of debt hanging over her head after she signed up for a dodgy online diploma course. But after months of worry, 
it seems her legal advice may have finally paid off. So it's from AVLI, which I believe must be somehow linked with the Phoenix Institute. So I've received an email and this is how it reads. Hi Tamara, I am from the Department of Education and Training and I confirm that AVLI, training organisation, has agreed to delete your debt with them. So for both the courses that they'd signed me up for, it's now saying that that amount is going to be cleared, which is amazing, really. But the vocational education scam has targeted thousands of poor and disadvantaged Australians who may not be so aware of their rights or even where to go for help. I think that more awareness should be created because I know for me, if I hadn't have been told, I would have sat there with this debt for the rest of forever until I, you know, maybe one day earned the amount of money where I had to start paying it back. I think it's pretty disgusting. It, it really does seem like the rich get richer and the poor get poorer sort of thing, you know? So those people that are sitting at the bottom scale of, of the economy, where's the ladder for those people? How do they actually, you know, gain any self-worth, any independence? How do they climb up that ladder? Because there's no one helping them. With a clean slate, it's back to the business at hand for Tamara and the chance to start growing her own fledgling business. But a week on, and Tamara's yeah. neighbour Alan's gardening business isn't exactly booming. As we speak, it's pretty tough, pretty challenging. So I'm just gonna take step by step. His biggest job recently was unpaid, tending his sister's yard as an apology for the $2,000 she had to pay to retrieve her dogs. This whole week, I haven't made much because, you know, Melbourne weather, it's like you have four seasons in a day. So it's pretty rough, you know. At the moment, I'm just concentrating on the business, but also family comes first. Alan may not yet have a head for business. Done well. But at Banksia Gardens, he's king of the kids. Well, I love making the kids happy no matter what. Anything just to keep them going, you know? Anything just to make them happy. I'll do anything for, the, for, for, for my uh, kids. So I'm loving it at the moment. Yes. Bye. I love being with my family, with my wife and kids. Being together as a family. That's what families are for, you know, to have that love and connection because, you know, love is more stronger than anything. Family. Next time on Struggle Street. Are you in there, dog boy? Another rent crisis means Michael could be back on the streets. There's not much hope if I get homeless again. I've had enough of life if that's what happens to me. How homelessness can threaten the most unlikely amongst us. He said, you've got four weeks, get out. The only problem is I've got nowhere to go. And a family at breaking point faces their worst fear. In the best interest of the kids, we've had to ring dogs. They just want to be happy for crying out loud. We all do. 